We we'll now move on to questions to the Minister of Education. We will start with listed questions, and I call Ms. Karen McEva. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one. The executive's budget has been reduced to date by the Westminster Government by £1.5 billion over the last five years. As a direct result of this reduction, there are significantly reduced finances to spend on frontline services provided by the Department of Education. I have protected the Sure Start budget as far as possible, uh, so that the original proposed reduction to £2 million has reduced to £1 million. It is anticipated that the reduction will be realised as far as possible from areas within service delivery where greater efficiencies can be realised with the aim of protecting frontline services. The focus will be on ensuring that services which have the most significant impact in achieving the better outcomes for children are maintained and protected. During the period 2012-15, Sure Start services have been gradually extended towards delivery to the top 25 per cent most disadvantaged wards. During that time, a further £4.4 million has been invested by the Department. Four new Sure Start projects have been created and 14 projects have expanded the catchment areas to extend services to an additional 21 wards. These services will be maintained. Expansion of service delivery is almost complete. Work is, going to, is ongoing to affect the expansion of services into the two remaining wards. Funds are available within the budget to enable this pro work to be completed. The quality of service provided by Sure Start projects is of paramount importance. The achievement of the objectives of the programme will continue to be closely monitored. Outcome, an outcomes framework is also in place and is the basis for DE to assign targets to the programmes, progress against which is an indicator of achievements of the anticipated outcomes of the programme. Call Mrs. McEvitt for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his response uh, to the question? Uh, given that over 30 per cent uh, present themselves with language acquisition problems uh, within the preschool years and the importance of the language development programmes that are currently um, uh, been taking place. Will any of these uh, invaluable language development programmes uh, be under threat as a result to the cut in funding? Well, I have made it clear both to my officials and uh, consequently to the deliverers of Sure Start that I want to see frontline services protected in these regards, and I want to see the most vulnerable continue to receive services through the Sure Start programme. I continue to monitor the situation and continue to request further information from my officials uh, through the Sure Start programme board, and I will continue to ensure that we protect our services as much as possible at the front line. But the reality is this. Continuing cuts uh, to the executive's budget means there's continuing cuts to the education budget, and it is frightening when you look at the pro proposals coming from the Conservative-led government in Westminster. Their continued cuts to public spending is going to have a detrimental impact upon on our public services here. I call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. And I thank the minister for his responses so far, and I look forward to uh, working with him. Uh, can I ask the minister, in terms of the Sure, uh, sure Start programme? Uh, what progress has been made in refining the criteria, particularly for oversubscribed programmes within Sure Start, uh, to ensure that uh, early intervention is better targeted? Uh, can I firstly congratulate the member on his appointment to the Chair of the Education Committee, and I also looking, look forward to working with him uh, in the months ahead. Uh, we have recently carried out a strategic review of the Sure Start programme. I am currently studying the report. It was carried out in conjunction with the Department of Health. Uh, who are the delivery body for Sure Start. And I, as I said, I'm studying the recommendations, which cover a wide range of issues, including the, the, the matters which the members has touched on in this question. And when I finish studying the report, I will move then to uh, publish its findings and to move forward to see how we continue to improve the delivery of services through Sure Start. We're still spending around £24 million in this project. When it was first uh, put into place, this total spend was around £9 million per annum. We are now up to £25, £24 million. It is quite a significant investment. It is making quite a significant positive impact to date, but we want to ensure that we are getting value for money in the truest sense of the word uh, in delivering that project going into the future. Call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Well, well, good, and I thank the Minister uh, for his, his uh, answer so far. I note that the Minister is reviewing the uh, findings from the independent review of Sure Start. Uh, maybe to push the Minister a bit in terms of time scale for when the review and the recommendations may actually be published. 
Um, unfortunately, I can't give the member a definitive date, but it is quite a substantial report. It is quite a detailed report, and I think it's only right and proper that I give it due consideration before acting on it further. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I would firstly declare an interest as a committee member of Horizon Sure Start. But uh, James Heckman, the um, Nobel Prize winning economist, has written extensively on the value for money of early years investment. So my question to the Minister is, why has he chosen to cut early years investment, which brings about benefits to the entire community, yet he's able to find money for a new post-primary Irish language school for 14 pupils? Well, uh, I haven't chosen to cut funding to early years. It has been imposed upon us by the Conservative Party, which has a mandate here which uh, is minuscule. Uh, and we are continuing to invest over £200 million in early years projects across the North. Quite a significant amount of money is being invested by my department in early years projects moving forward. But we have seen year on year cuts to the block grant, which means that there's going to be year on year cuts to the monies the Department of Education has to spend. And I will remind the member, and I will remind others in the House, that just before Christmas 2014 there was a debate in the House which called on the Department of Education to protect classroom spending. And I stood at this dispatch box and I said to everyone gathered that education is much broader than the classroom, that education is about early years, education is about youth services, education is about community involvement as well. And in fact, there was an amendment in from my party colleagues to that effect. The Assembly voted to protect classroom services, as did the member. So the member can now stand in front of me and pontificate about early year services when he voted actually that classroom services were more important than early year services. I call Mr. Donny Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Speaker. Um, question two, please. Uh, my department does not employ teachers. It is currently the policy of the Council for Celtic Maintained Schools that teachers seeking employment in a Celtic Maintained Primary and Nursery School must hold a teacher certificate in religious education. In 2013, my department agreed to undertake a review of teaching employment opportunities. The aim of this review was to investigate concerns that the requirement to possess the certificate could lead to inequality in employment of and opportunities for teachers. Whilst the review concluded that there was no statistical evidence to, su to suggest that a requirement of the certificate has resulted in inequalities of employment, it did, however, identify barriers in accessing the certificate, which may lead to inequalities for those who wish to obtain it. CCC CCMS has since amended its appointment scheme to allow teachers who did not hold the certificate and who would otherwise be made redundant to be redeployed into a Catholic maintained school and then be required to secure the certificate within three years of redeployment. Call Mr. Kinahan for a supplementary. Um, thank you very much. And I thank the Minister for his answer. And we, we, we hear that there's still, it's still needed after three years. But the Minister said on the 9th of February that in the teaching of the sacraments, I believe that there are other ways of achieving that objective and goal for the Catholic sector rather than every teacher having a certificate. But that position lasted 24 hours before it completely was contradicted by the Minister. Who's setting the policy? Is it Blue House, Connolly House? Or is he changing his mind? Well, I wonder what the line of communication is like, are like in the Ulster Unionist Party, because your colleague, uh, Sandra Overend, asked me the exact same question at last question time. Now, I know you were all busy with elections and there was canvassing going on, etc., etc., but at least you could talk to each other. I give, I give, I give an answer to Sander Overend, and I will repeat it to yourself. To err is human, to forgive is divine. I made a mistake in my, in my answer, to which I believe was a topical question. I corrected it the next day, as I should do, and is re required of me by the Speaker, and everyone received a letter the day or the day following that. And that's practically verbatim the response I give to Ms. Overend, uh, was it four weeks ago? Thank you. Call Mr. Pachi. Uh, 
about uh, a free last concordia. Can the Minister outline what progress has been made over recent years to ensure greater access to the Certificate for Religious Education? Uh, following the review carried out by the Department, uh, there has been a number of measures taken. The provision of fee reimbursement regarding distance learning courses for the certificate. Stranmillis University College has been assisted by St Mary's University College to explore how both institutions could collaborate to provide Stranmillis students with the opportunity to obtain the certificate. And Stranmillis has advised my department that they now provide information on their website regarding how to access the certificate and will also be facilitating a number of support seminars with designated tutor for students who are completing the certificate through distance learning. So there have been several significant steps taken since my department carried out the review following concerns expressed by a number of, of members of the House, uh, and which will assist people of all denominations and none to achieve this certificate. And I would advise members who, who have continued to have concerns about this matter to also sit down and talk the matter through with CCMS. It is they who are the employing authority who adopt the use of this certificate. So if they have concerns, sit down with CCMS, express their concerns to the CCMS and talk the matter out. Call Mr Nelson McCausley. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, all primary school teachers would receive some element in their training that would presumably equip them to teach religious education as part of their normal uh, training. Um, could the minister tell us what it is uh, that is contained in the preparation of the certificate for religious education that is additional? That, is it purely preparation for the Roman Catholic uh, Sacrament of Confirmation, or are there other elements as well? I confess to not being an expert. Uh, in the Catholic certificate. As I said in, the, in my response to uh, Mr Sheehan, if members of the House have concerns about the, uh, the Catholic certificate or want to have more information about this Catholic certificate or why CCMS believe it is to be important to their sector, then I suggest they sit down with CCMS and talk the matter through. Call Mr Sean Rogers. Mr Deputy Speaker, and just following on from Mr Sheehan's question, Minister, what discussions have you had with your Dale colleague to ensure that students in Stranmillis and students who are doing PCCEs have equal access to this certificate? Well, as I've set out in uh, the, following the review which my department carried out in 2013, it is clear that both St Mary's and Stranmillis universities are working together to facilitate people of all denominations and none to obtain this certificate. There's no opportunities for distance learning within this matter as well. I've had no direct discussions, uh, which I can recall standing here with, with Minister Farr in regards to this matter, but there's clearly been cooperation between the teaching colleges and others in regards to this matter, following on from the review which I commissioned in 2013. Call Mr Trevor Lund. Gormi, I got a free of last concordia. It's cashed a tree. That's question number three, Minister. Uh, Gorm Boyk, it's question Valor and Cash. Thank the member for his question. Uh, initial discussions have taken place between officials in the Treasury and the NAO, the Department of Finance and Personnel, and the Department of Education to establish which projects could potentially be funded under the £500 million capital investment. Discussions will continue, and we hope to achieve successful conclusion. Well, Mr. Lund for supplementary. Yes, yeah, so thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask him how he's going to ensure that the, the money will provide added value in terms of increased outcomes for shared and integrated education rather than being used just to prop up uh, under pressure capital schemes? Well, um, I can assure all parties to the discussions. Um, if not foremost to their minds, certainly in their minds is ensuring that we receive value for money in investing, which is quite a significant amount of capital, into our education system. But any school which we do invest in going into the future will have to be a sustainable school. It will have to be a school that has shown that it, it can uh, meet the sustainability figures and going into the future will uh, create a sustainable learning environment for the young people attending. So all those things are in the melting pot. All those things are being discussed out. Uh, I just want to reach the point where we have a successful conclusion, where we can start using the funds uh, to develop further and enrich our, our education estate. I have to say, I do not see any investment or any further monies coming our way as being used simply to prop up, which is a significantly depleted 
capital uh, budget within my department, um, but any monies I use, I will always use wisely. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, Her Majesty's um, Government's contribution of 500 million new capital under the Stormont House Agreement is subject to um, those projects being agreed, as I understand it, between uh, the Executive and the UK Government. Could the Minister please explain just how he thinks that will work in practice? Who will be involved in it? And does, in fact, the um, Northern Ireland Office and the Executive have to agree together all the projects? Well, as I said in response to the original question, uh, the NAO, Treasury, Department of Finance and Personnel, and my own department are talking to each other about how we set out the perimeters of this project and how we deliver this project. Um, I, it's clear from that context that we will all have to agree the broad framework. Whether we have to come down to agree to each individual project is a matter for further discussion, but at this stage what we want to agree is the broad parameters of how the money can be invested going into the future, and then we will get down to the fine minutia of the negotiations in terms of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Call Mr. John Dalla. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, how can the Minister ensure that shared education goes beyond the annual outing to the Balmoral show in the same bus and, in fact, genuinely uh, uh, awards those schools that bring their children together to work together and to be educated together? Well, I, I would encourage everyone to visit the Balmoral show. It's a fine day out and it's a good insight into the rural community. Uh, and the, the investment which our rural communities and our farming community give to our economy. But I understand where the member is coming from, uh, and we will be bringing legislation, well, hopefully, we'll be bringing legislation uh, before the Assembly in the near future. I am preparing a paper to submit to my executive colleagues, hopefully, before the end of this month, which will receive agreement to bring forward draft legislation to set out how and the objectives and the goals of shared education, because it has to move beyond sharing the bus. It has to move to talking about each other, learning from each other, respecting each other's cultural points of view. And I think the best way to do that is for young people to learn about each other from each other. Call Ms. Zana Lowe. Question number four, please. Anticipating the educational needs in an area and planning to meet those needs through a network of sustainable schools is the key objective of the area planning process. The aim is to ensure that we have the right type and size of schools in the right places to meet the needs of our pupils. It is the responsibility of the planning authorities to plan for primary school provision in the carried off area and to bring forward proposals for my consideration. Recently, I have had representations from the local community regarding their concerns about maintaining primary provision in this area. I have therefore asked the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools in January 2015 to work with the former South Eastern Eastern Education Board and, uh, and other sectors in the area to put in pl place a plan to deal with the issues being raised and to keep me updated on progress. CCMS has confirmed that within the last few months they have reviewed the position again in the Kerry Duff area. They state that the number of unplaced children in the area is not sufficiently high to enable CCMS to bring proposals to the Department for an increase in primary school provision. However, CCMS will review that position again following the end of the admissions process for September 2015. Well, Ms. Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Prince, uh, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Sorry. Um, I thank the, minister, uh, thank the minister for his answer. Similarly, um, in South Belfast, we see a huge shortage on uh, nursery and playgroup places. Is there any plan to again address this uh, oversubscription? Well, I think firstly we need to define huge uh, oversubscription. Uh, what we have just witnessed is the first round of placements in preschool settings. Uh, the vast majority of parents and children were placed uh, within that first round. We are now involved in the second round where parents have been provided with a list of available places and we are encouraging parents to respond and identify places upon that list which are suitable uh, to their children 
and that's the process we're involved in at the minute. We, as a department level, uh, we're also engaged with the PEGS groups in each of the areas, asking them to continually monitor the situation and provide us with up-to-date data as to where additional places may be required. I have sufficient funding to provide additional places where they are required uh, moving forward. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, uh, as the Minister will be aware, Carrie Duff in that wider area it has grown uh, substantially and there is existing major pressure on the school provision there. It is going to grow even more in terms of uh, spaces for planning permission and further housing. So what longer term plan is the Minister uh, engaging in to ensure that the provision uh, for educational places is there for those who want to move into that area? Well, as, as I outlined to Ms Lowe, the responsibility rests with, uh, firstly, well, jointly, CCMS and the South Eastern Region of the Education Authority, and we have, have in place an area planning process. We are looking forward uh, in terms of projections of numbers in areas, and all managing authorities are under no doubts that they have to ensure that they are planning a number of years ahead for educational provision. And we often hear of area planning in the context of schools closing, but our area planning also works in the context of expanding of individual schools or the building and the provision of completely new schools in new areas to meet demand going forward. Uh, CCMS have reported back, because there was particular pressure in the Catholic sector in that area, that while there is a pressure, it does not need to be dealt with at this stage through what is known as a development proposal or a significant number of increase in places. It may and can be dealt with through temporary variations at this stage, but they have also, been, they've also indicated and we have also said to them that they need to continue to keep the situation under constant review and plan for it as much as they possibly can. Call Mr. Declan McAleer. The Education Maintenance Alliance Scheme was jointly introduced in September 2004 by the Department of Employment and Learning and the Department of Education. Dale holds the, the budget for the payment of the Alliance, but I have allocated $1.85 million in 13-14 and $3.6 million each year from 14-15 to fund the bonus payment element of the scheme. In addition, I have created a small budget which the Department allocates to the schools to help fund the cost of administering the scheme. This was $318,014.15. Mr McAleer for supplementary. Margaret, does the Minister believe that the welfare reform will have an impact on the EMA eligibility criteria? No, in the case of EMA, I do not believe it will have an impact in terms of the eligibility criteria. There may be uh, a refinement of other benefits in terms of free school meals entitlement, uh, which may be required if and when welfare reform is agreed. But EMA, based on how uh, it is, is based on family income rather than individual income, should be able to fit into any welfare reform that is being proposed. Well, Ms. Rosalind McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. and I thank the Minister for his for his answers thus far. But in Diglo Mira and Ira, oh he was sent to New Edgecus Rentage. Because he talked to when in the groupy saw Aknami Akta, come while the groupy creative a way scenario. Can I ask the Minister what is the importance of including socio-economic groups as well as religious groups in any shared education definition? Uh, go on, break the and Valor and Kesh. Though uh, I'm not sure, is the member referring to question six? And to move on to the next question, rather than question six. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the draft legislation definition of shared education, which is subject to public consultation, references. Uh, those of different religious belief or political opinion, as well as those experiencing socio-economic deprivation and those who are not. Prior to finalising the definition, I am considering the inclusion of political opinion following feedback from the public consultation. Sharing works a policy for shared education expands upon the legislative de definition with a practical description based on that endorsed by the Ministerial Advisory Group on Shared Education that includes all Section 75 categories. Ms McCordy for a supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. But my mistake, I asked my supplementary question for the question, so I'm happy with the Minister's response. I call the Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy. Question number seven. In January 2013, uh, I announced the Davenish project to replace Davenish College and to facilitate the amalgamation or closure of Liston Ski High School. The business case of the project has been approved by the Department of Finance and Personnel at an estimated capital cost of £23.2 million. A tender has also recently been approved by my Department of Tech for enabling works to facilitate the new build. This work will commence shortly. Procurement is underway for an integrated design team to take forward the design for the new school, and it is anticipated that the inter this integrated design team will be appointed uh, later this month. Planning Commission and other statutory approvals will have to be obtained before appointment of the contract to carry out the build. It is currently expected that the new build will complete in November 2018 and will provide a modern place of learning and teaching for the future pupils of Davenish College. Well, Lord Morrow for supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for his answer and uh, uh, listening to his answer, I think there are some positives in what he is saying. However, I think it is still disappointing that he is now talking about the year 2018 for completion. And, uh, of course, the, this uh, Assembly has only one year of its term still to run, so it is not going to happen in this term. Can the Minister assure us a bit more definite today that he is real about this programme and that, in fact, we are going to see this one carried through because it has been on the agenda for a long, long time, as he is very aware. Well, I welcome the fact that I have moved Lord Morrow from a point of believing that this would never happen to a point of believing that well, there are some positives in it. I am very positive about this project. Uh, it is not unusual for capital programmes to roll from one administration into another, but you have to plan moving forward. We are awarding uh, the contract uh, a design team will be appointed in May 2015 of this year. We are moving forward. Completion by November 2018 will mean that construction work will have to start at some stage within uh, 2016. I have moved this project on more uh, than anyone else. It has come to the stage now where it is definite that it is moving ahead. There, in fact, there are some enabling works I understand already on site because the topography of the site is quite difficult and we have had to spend not an insignificant amount of money in preparing the site for the new build. So I think, in fact, I'm confident that Devonish College can look into the future with great confidence. Mr. Patsy McGowan is not in his place. I call Mr. Paul Given. Question number nine. Uh, the Preschool Education Advisory Group, PEG, of the, each region in the Education Authority, are responsible for ensuring that there is adequate preschool provision in local areas. The Chief Executive of the Education Authority has advised me that at the end of Key Stage 1 of the preschool admissions process, 62 children were unplaced in the Ligon Valley constituency area. 1,649 applicants were received, 1,552 children were offered a place, and 95 places remain available. A new provider has been introduced for parents to consider at, key, at Stage 2 of the process, and if necessary, additional sessions can be provided at other settings. It is important to point out that these figures represent the end of stage one of the, stool, of the, of the preschool admissions process only. I have made available sufficient funding to meet the projected need for preschool places for the 15-16 academic year, and have strongly encouraged parents of children who have not received the offer of a funded preschool place to consider all preschool provision that remains available and provide a range of preferences at stage two to increase the chances of securing a place for their child. For the 14-15 admissions year, 99.9% .9 of children whose parents stayed with the admissions process received the offer of a funded preschool place. I ask the member to be brief in his supplementary. Each year, Minister, there is always this scenario, particularly in the North Lisburn part of the Lagan Valley constituency. Surely something is going wrong whenever uh, every year this situation is repeated. And will he undertake to review the provision in some of the highly uh, sought after places that people are applying for in the Lagan Valley constituency? It is a matter for the PEGS group in the area to review the places. And I, well, one part of me understands why the media concentrates on those who did not get in. But when you look at the figures, there was 
1,649 applicants, 1,552 children were offered a place in the first round. Now, none of those parents are going to come into your constituency office and say, thanks very much, we've got a place. Of course, and quite rightly so, parents who haven't got a place will come and say, I didn't get a place, we need to sort this out. Now, we're only at stage one. There's another stage to go through. We will continue to work with the parents in your area, and we will continue to monitor the situation through the PEGS group. And if there is insufficient places in that area, I have committed to providing the finances to ensure that we uh, place children in the nearest suitable location uh, for parents and the child going forward. So it's not just not a case of finances. We have no, the finances. No, no. It's a very complicated uh, system we have to go through, and we're continuing to work on it. It ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call on Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister for Education how many funded nursery schools in East Belfast were oversubscribed for 2015-16? Uh, in fairness, I know this is topical questions. <laughs> uh, it's impossible for me to have all that information in front of me. I'm more than happy to provide the member with, with, with the information. But the picture across all constituencies is that the vast, vast majority of children have been placed. Uh, in areas where there is referred to as hotspots, we are continuing to monitor the situation through the PEGS group. As I said uh, to Mr Gibbon, we, this is not a case of finances. We will provide finances where it is required to provide new places. Uh, but we are only at the first stage of this process. This is, there's another stage. Parents have been asked to come forward with further preferences on a list provided. Oh, and I, I emphasise again, all the places on the list will not suit the parents that were sent to. This is a generic list sent from uh, the regional offices of the authority, and all places will not suit. So I encourage parents to stick with the process, and we will continue to move this forward. Well, Mr. Little, for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his response, and I can advise him that there are a number of nursery schools in East Belfast that are oversubscribed for 2015 16, and after round one, there are. Uh, I have received a number of calls uh, from parents seeking help whose child has not been uh, offered a place from Newtonards Road to Dundonald right across East Belfast. So can I ask the Minister um, what work he is doing to improve application guidance uh, and also to provide accessible additional nursery places in East Belfast? Well, we both don't know the number then. That's, we can confirm that. Uh, but we, we do know that the vast majority of parents have been placed, or pupils have been placed. There's a difference between nurseries being oversubscribed and insufficient places in an area. Yes, parents may not get uh, the, school or the nursery school places they bid for. That may right well be the case. Now, what we have made changes over the years, for instance, up until a year ago, a nursery school could only accept 26 places could only accept 26 or 52, whichever, or perhaps they have maybe three. I have now increased that where they can take in a further four if, there's a, if demand is recognised by the PEGS groups. We have also brought in extra community and voluntary places. And this is an important provider. In terms of the community and voluntary sector, they're an important provider for PEGS places. They're also an important provider for broader community and voluntary work in communities. So we have to be careful sometimes when we call for more nursery school places because it's often code for take them off the community and voluntary sector, give them to the nursery schools, and you will see a decline in your community and voluntary sector straight away because it's an important source of income uh, for those providers. So there has been significant changes over this last three to four years. I, I think it was the first year I was in office I carried out a review of preschool provision. Since then, it has improved beyond recognition. And as I said to the previous questioner, the vast majority of parents are placed. Only 25% of that placement, by the way, is in relation to social deprivation figures. So the, the, the upcry about uh, priority being aimed to social deprivation doesn't stack up when you look at the figures. But you will continue to be lobbied, and rightly so, by parents who have not been placed. But we're only at stage one. The process is not being complete. And as I say, last year, 99.9% .9 of parents who stuck with the system had their child placed. Mr Stephen Ignew is not in his place. I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I can thank the Minister. Uh, what consideration is being given, Minister, uh, to changing the GCSE scoring system uh, to match the new system in England, given that many Northern Ireland schools do both 
English and uh, Northern Ireland board exams. Does the Minister agree that a mixed scoring system is confusing for both uh, students and employers? Well, I, I have in place an examinations review body and I have asked them to carry out further work in relation to our exam system, to look at all aspects of our examination system and how the quality of our examination system and also how we compare with other jurisdictions in these islands and how transferable and portable our exams are. And that work continues and I will continue to take advice off them. Clearly I am aware of the changes to the scoring metrics in England, but it is not going to present a significant problem to our students because, remember this, students from throughout the world travel to universities in these groups of islands. So our universities are very used to dealing with different examinations. They are very used to dealing with different scoring systems. And we will continue to liaise with universities, particularly in England and Wales, around this matter. And I am confident that as we move forward, there will be no detrimental impact upon our students. Mr. McKinney, for supplementary. Thank you. And, and while there might be confidence uh, with the minister and there might be confidence in the institutions, how does that confidence translate to those who are taking the exams when they may view the result in decimal as being different from that in, in, in uh, A, B or C? Well, this is a matter of communications with, with our schools through careers advisors and also through uh, senior management within schools. And all those, all those things are continuing to happen. As I said, I will continue to keep the matter under review. I am taking advice from an expert group in relation to the examination system. We have taken each step very slowly, and I believe rightly so. That expert group uh, is made up of educationalists, it's made up of further and higher educationalists, it's made up of the business sector and others who are taking a very rounded look at our examination system. I had commented in the past that I believe when, when Minister Gove or Secretary Gove was in place in education that they had moved too quickly. I'm still of that view. I believe if we take this at uh, an informed pace, then there will be no detrimental impact upon our students. I call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Mm. <laughs> He's in somebody else's place. Thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, with regard to uh, nursery provision in the north of Lisburg, you're going to get a repeat here. Uh, for five years now in a row, there has been a lack of provision in that area. And there's also a lack of provision in Moira. Can the Minister give us a commitment that we will actually have that situation reviewed? Um, the member has taken an unusual step that will not be in this place, but be in somebody else's place. Uh, I can assure the member that these matters are under constant review at PEGS group level. Uh, Lisbon has thrown up a number of issues throughout the years. We have been able to react to them, uh, both in terms of short, medium and long term, and I have, no, I have every confidence that we will be able to react uh, in, in the weeks and months ahead to those as well. But I will under, undertake to write to that local PEGS group and seek further confirmation from them that they are keeping the matter under constant review and what plans they have for now and in the future. Well, Mr. Craig for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the uh, Minister for his commitment there because I personally feel there is something wrong with what the PEGS group is doing because if this was a, a short-term issue over a year or two, I could understand it. But for the past five years, we have had ongoing difficulties and people being told that places up to 16 miles away from their locality. So, Minister, can, when you do speak to the PEG groups, will you be forceful with them with regard to this issue? Because we need medium to long term planning in Lagan Valley. I reaffirm to the member that I will speak. I don't, I don't necessarily think I have to speak to them firmly, but I will engage with them uh, on this matter and impress home the concerns that have been raised by representatives in the House today. Well, Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Mr. Minister, the recent announcement to cuts to the early years funding has sent shockwaves through the, the local community, especially those in my own constituent, Harpers Hall Cube Family Centre and Ahidu Playgroup. Is the Minister any words of comfort that they could pass on to these groups? Um, uh, well, I, I don't wish to hand out words of comfort that are meaningless, but I will say this. I have my budget under review. Uh, I've 
be making bids to the June monitoring round, and if I do secure funding either from within my own budget or from the June monitoring round, the item at the very top of the list is early years. Uh, but, however, we will have to change how we deliver the early years fund. It has operated as a closed fund since 2004, which means that only those groups that were in in 2004 can continue to apply. So there's many organisations within your constituency, with mine, with other members' organ uh, constituencies who cannot apply to the fund and who are as equally deserving of places because I have received also criticism uh, of the early years fund from that perspective. So I will seek further funding for that project, but it will have to be delivered in a, in a different criteria, but certainly targeting areas of greatest need. Mr. McQuillan, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I agree with what he says. There are other people that need funding as well, and I agree with that there, but um, would they agree with me also that early years funding is very important in a child's education, and this is maybe one of the last places we should be looking to cut, no matter what our budget is saying? Well, uh, I, I said at the Education Committee when I delivered my budget that we are now among the sacred cows. There is no fat left in the system where we can go to and trim it off and say that will have no impact on communities, it will have no impact on education, it will have no impact. I am now down to the bone. I am now among sacred cows. I am making decisions around funding which I never thought I would have to make. And that is why I am so concerned with what is coming at us. Uh, from the current Conservative government, because whether it be myself in education or another education minister, if there's further cuts, they are going to the detriment of our young people and to our economy. Well, Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, but, um, uh, could the minister provide me with a progress update on the Lesson LA Educational Campus? Uh, I am pleased to advise that the Department is making steady and significant progress on the Lesson Alley programme. The contract for the construction of the first school on site, Arville East School and Resource Centre, has been awarded to Woodville Construction and work has now begun on site. Uh, opening remains on track for September 2016. The main campus, which compromises the five post primary schools, remains on schedule to open in 2020. Mr. McAleer, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister for answer. Uh, given the budgetary constraints at present, is, is the Minister confident that, he, that the project will be completed on time? Well, the Listen Alley programme has been within the program, this programme for government and previous programme for governments, and I have no doubt that it will continue into 2020. I have secured funding for this year to move the project forward. I have no doubt that there will be capital funds available for it next year. So, the, the, the project is at such an advanced stage. The project is of such significance. Uh, both educationally, society and economically, I have no doubt that it will continue to be a programme for governments and successive ministers will continue to support it. Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the minister provide us with an update on the progress of the Foyle and Ebrington College in the waterside of Londonderry? Uh, it, is, it too is making quite significant progress. I believe I am attending an event in the next number of weeks uh, in relation to the opening of the site uh, for development. And that's a very welcome uh, development in, that, in your constituency as well, providing uh, new facilities for Foyle and Arrington. For a supplementary. And can I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed I agree with the comments that he has made. Uh, in terms of the complicate, there has been a number of complications throughout the, um, the, the project. Uh, can the Minister foresee any other uh, complications that could um, delay this uh, project further? Well, Let's hope not. But when you go into a major development, there's all sorts of things can crop up. Now, I would expect at this stage, site searches have been done and all the, the, the knotweeds of various varieties, if they're there, they've been identified. And all, all the problems that can arise when you put a major capital program on site have been identified. Now, uh, I expect now for a relatively smooth journey for, towards completion uh, of this project and look forward to the official opening in the next number of years. Time is up. Uh, members will wish to take their ease while we change the top table. Can I apologise to the House? I missed my, my question earlier. There was no deliberate intent or no slight to the House on my part. It just entirely slipped my mind. Okay. Thank you.